Coming up next on Arizona Horizon, how well is Arizona prepared to handle cases of Ebola if the virus ever makes it here? Also tonight, a debate on a ballot measure allowing terminal patients to try experimental drugs or treatments. And we'll hear about a study that looks at violence among chimpanzees. That's next on Arizona Horizon. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to Arizona Horizon. I'm Ted Simons. The presence of Ebola in the U.S. is far from an outbreak, but there are concerns over how cases of the virus have been handled in Texas. Here now to discuss how well Arizona is prepared for an Ebola case is Will Humble, director of the Arizona Department of Health Services. Good to see you again. Thanks for joining Good us. Good evening. Thanks. Uh, overview here. What is Ebola? How is it caught? How is it diagnosed? What are we talking about? So Ebola is a virus. It's um, been in Af There's been about 19 uh, outbreaks throughout the years since 1976 in Africa. Most of them have been very limited in scale and scope. This is the unique outlier because it's gotten to become a major outbreak in major cities in three countries in West Africa. Um, and as you know, we've had a travel case that came to Texas and then two subsequent cases it looks like um, from that initial case. Okay, so how does it spread? And again, how is it diagnosed? So it's, it's, it's spread through direct contact. So in other words, if you had the Ebola virus and I was sitting here talking to you and doing an assessment of you as a physician, I would be at no risk because I'm not, and I'm not in contact with your bodily fluid. Um, but if I'm actually going to be able to treat you, run IV lines or um, help you uh, to breathe with uh, certain kinds of equipment and be more invasive or get my hands on you, then, or if I were to touch your uh, vomit or diarrhea, something like that, then you get to be into a dangerous situation if you don't have the right kinds of protection. And the diagnosis, how, do, how is that handled? Well, the diagnosis is the absolute key, and that's what we've been focusing on in Arizona over the last couple weeks really hard with uh, physicians and clinicians, emergency departments, et cetera, because the, the real key to having an, an effective response is to be able to find any case that comes into Arizona right away. So if there's somebody who had been traveling to West Africa, came to Arizona, showed up, for example, at a community health center with Ebola-like symptoms, it's really critical for the triage nurse or the clinicians that first assess that patient to get a really good travel history so that they understand if they have been to West Africa or not, was it in the last 21 days or not, which is the incubation period, and if they were there within the 21 days, what were they doing? Were they working in a clinic or were they just going fishing and they weren't around anybody? So those are all real critical components to deciding who are the patients that you're gonna place into isolation. Because that's the really key next step after you've made a determination that this, this patient was in West Africa, has Ebola symptoms, uh, you need to decide what to do. Put that patient in isolation, and then the component comes into play where you've got to have the right kinds of protection for the workers so that they don't jeopardize their own health by providing care to the patient, and that's what we've seen happen in yes, Texas. Yes, yes. Real quickly, the incubation period. If, if I have Ebola, but I'm only in the incubation period, no symptoms, no signs as yet, is it still a problem if I cough on you or if it would have something no. like that? So one of the things that we have to our advantage with this illness, with this virus, is that folks are infectious after they really, really start to feel bad. But not before. But not before. Okay. Unlike the flu, like yes. influenza, yes. you can be infectious and you're still at work and you don't even really feel it. Um, it's not so with Ebola. You need to be symptomatic before you're, before you're infectious. And again, it takes direct contact, not like the measles or flu or something like that. Okay, um, any cases at all uh, linked to Arizona so far that we know of? No, not so far that we know of. And like I said, we've really been uh, getting the word out to frontline workers to make sure that they have the right protocol. It's an algorithm for the travel history do you match up with the symptoms to make that designation about whether or not that patient goes into isolation? You know, in Texas, the patient went to an emergency department. You know, 
in Arizona, it might not happen that way. The person might go to their primary care physician. They might go to a urgent care at a strip mall. They might go to a community health center. So we've got to reach out to clinicians, frontline clinicians in all of those settings so that they understand what kinds of questions to ask regarding travel history and then know what to do from there. Okay, are you reaching out and are they listening and taking notes and watching what's going on? Oh, I think there's, there, so we're reaching out, that's for sure. Some people have heard our message, I think, more than they need to. And there's probably others that you might be able to find that say, well, why aren't they contacting me? And that's why we're reaching out in various different ways. We have what's called a health alert network where folks have signed up for the service. It goes to infection practitioners at hospitals, um, a lot of clinicians that are used to working in pre the preparedness field. So it goes out that way. We're working through the associations, through the newsletter for the uh, Arizona Medical Association. Um, we're working through any vehicle that we can find to get those, especially index case identification protocols out to the clinicians, followed by what they need to know in terms of isolation and then protecting their staff in terms of, of protection. What about things like airports? I mean, is the airport aware of what's going on here? Well, uh, there's a there's a whole believe it or not there's a whole guidance document that Maricopa County put together with um, with Sky Harbor, and there's a whole protocol around should something happen at the airport. But again, remember, in th with this virus, the person A needs to be sick before they're infectious, and B it's not airborne. It's not like the measles. So with those two things in mind, yes. it puts places like airports at lower risk, but. Healthcare workers with direct patient care who haven't been trained in the right kinds of personal protection at the higher risk. So this is manageable. I mean, Doctors Without Borders has been working on this epidemic yes. in Africa under primitive conditions for many months now, and they've been keeping their staff safe. If they can do it under those conditions, there's absolutely no reason why we can't do it here. So lesson learned in Dallas. Training, 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 and communication. All right, Will, good to see you. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Besides State Route 90, about 12 miles from Mexico, is a monument to Fort Huachuca. Today a high-tech training facility, but also a key outpost in Arizona history. Founded in 1877 as a temporary camp, Camp Huachuca protected miners, ranchers, and travelers against Apache attack. After Geronimo's surrender in 1886, the fort protected the border and in 1915 supported General Black Jack Pershing's expedition against Pancho Villa. A statue at the fort celebrates black soldiers who served here first in 1892, then continuously since 1913, when the 10th Cavalry, nicknamed by Indians the Buffalo Soldiers, were sent here. In 1942, the first all-black division was stationed here. Fort Huachuca has a long and distinguished record of support for the people of Arizona. Arizona Horizons Vote 2014 coverage continues tonight with a look at Proposition 303, which allows a terminally ill patient to try medicine and treatments that have not yet received full approval by the U.S. Food and Drug Administration. Here to debate the right to try proposition is Paulina Morris, a supporter of the measure who took her son to England for an experimental treatment, and Joan Kerber Walker, president and CEO of the Arizona Bio Industry Association. Good to have you both here. Thank, Thank you so you. much Thank for joining you. us. Um, what exactly does Prop 303 call for and why do you think it's necessary? Well, um, Ted, I think it's necessary because terminally ill patients in Arizona need to have access to experimental drugs that haven't made it through the full FDA process. They, ha they should have a right to try to save their own lives, to save their own families. Do they not already have that right? Is that procedure not already in place on the federal level? They do have procedures, but they're not available to many people. A very few uh, are able to access those drugs when they need them. These things happen overnight, like it did to my son. And, and, and I want to get to your son in a second, that story, but again, Prop 303, why do you think it's not necessary? So to start off with, you know, as we look across the existing process, the FDA's EAP process, the extended access process, is in place, does work, and very rarely do they turn someone down. And that process is designed to both protect patients and to ensure that the ongoing clinical trials continue in a 
a way that makes it clear that those drugs can get to patients if they are safe and effective as quickly as possible. Every time we do a one-off, we potentially slow down the process for many patients. The idea, though, that, as we heard, that maybe not every Arizona has access to the FDA approval, uh, to the federal uh, uh, approval uh, system, and doesn't seem to be like that these folks have that option. Is, is that a valid argument? Unfortunately, that's not the case. If you look at the process today, a physician, and it's always the physician, the physician is the key with the patient. The physician is working with the patient. The physician identifies an opportunity. The physician goes to the drug company and makes a request for access to the drug or the medical device that might help the patient. At that point today, the physician and the drug company go to the FDA and request an EAP. So um, that process already exists. Yes, and it'll be even better with Prop 303. How? It allows a patient, along with their physician, and the drug manufacturer to decide whether that's the right drug for that child or that adult, whomever it is, with an informed decision to be able to save their life. Uh, for the critics who would say that it's dangerous to treat uh, with drugs or treatment without enough study, getting past the first phase only, uh, there's a reason why it takes time for FDA approval. You say? Too long. Too many years, hundreds of millions of dollars. Those drugs are not available when we need them. Our son was 11 years old when he was diagnosed with osteosarcoma. We had to make quick decisions, and my husband and I made, did the research, did the homework, traveled to Mexico City, talked to physicians in Israel and England and Germany and Italy about this drug that was not available to our son in the United States, something that could potentially save his life. What, for parents like this, what's the harm? If, if, it's, if it's a situation in which traditional chemotherapy in this case or, or traditional uh, treatments just aren't working, they've been tried, they haven't worked, what's wrong with trying something that may not have full FDA approval? The challenge that we're looking at is that in Paulina's case, and it was a great outcome, and I'm so happy for you. Thank you. You had the financial wherewithal. You had the resources to make those and choices. And I'm here for those children who don't have the financial okay. resources, who need those drugs now and in Arizona. I'm not here for politics. I'm not here for polls. I'm not getting paid to be here. Right. I'm here for those children who don't have options, who can't travel. But and I can't help minute, it. I get Paulina, emotional about this. And I this. get emotional about it, too, yes. because when we look at those children, mm -hmm. okay, this piece of policy, and my objection is not to helping patients get the best care. But it is. No, People need let me finish right just away. like they I let you wait finish. can't 10 years. I agree that we need to be able to speed up the process. But this law does not provide for who pays for these drugs. It does not provide who pays for the medical care. So your family had the resources to be able to do what you did. We made those decisions. And that's great. Some yes. people don't have the option correct, to make those decisions. But they should have the right to try. They should have that chance. They, they should, should have also some hope. have the ability to know that those drugs are safe and effective. And because they can. what, wait, because what we are looking at is that we are creating an alternate pathway that is a dead end because the drug companies, the hospitals... How dare you say dead end? You know what? We went to another country for I know a drug for our son. And you could. And you're telling me it was a dead end? No, what I'm saying is this piece of public policy is creating a pathway where the people that you're being asked to go to are still governed by and responsible under federal law. And by preempting federal law, you put them in a position where they are not able to help the patient the way they would like to. Patients can make informed decisions with their physician, with the drug manufacturer. Again, uh, those against this idea say that it does put doctors in, in a legal, t legal tenuous kind of position it legally. Does not. Um, uh, drug companies in legally tenuous positions because there is no FDA approval and they could be liable if results or if problems come from non-tested drugs. Ted, I understand those questions, but Prop 303 addresses those problems. It gives the physician the right not to be involved in this. It has to be prescribed by a physician. It's an informed decision with the patient, the physician, the insurance company is not liable. The drug manufacturer does not have to make the drug available.
These are choices. It's just the right to try. Can, can, can a physician, can a drug company be exempt from liability? Not if under federal statute. They don't have to participate. They don't have to be part of my son's treatment or anyone else's that treatment. That is correct, but when they do, mm -hmm. when those corporations do, then they are potentially liable under Just like under in every law. other situation, whether it's Prop 303 or not. No, that's not true, Paulina, Yes, it is. Every doctor law, is not immune from liability we or are, any drug We're not talking about malpractice here. Mm -hmm. Okay. What we're talking about is under federal statute, there is a process that needs to be followed. If a case is tried in federal court, according to the Deputy Attorney General of the state of Colorado, who testified on this, and we have the testimony online, I'm glad they you would mentioned lose. Colorado. They would lose. Arizona is follow, falling in line with other states who are passing this unanimously, mm -hmm. such as Missouri, Colorado, Louisiana. I think Michigan's made an effort. Thirteen more states are going to bring this forward. Have we seen problems in any of those states that have passed this so far? We have not because it's very, very new. And even in Colorado, Colorado is already making adjustments because they recognize that the policy that they originally passed needed to be and adjusted. And the people are speaking throughout the country. They're saying the process currently as it exists is not sufficient. So instead of opposing people's mm -hmm. right to try to save their own lives, I wish you would try and help us develop a better process. And I agree. And one that once this passes, it can be effective and get kids and our loved ones Left. drugs right when they By need it. By doing what you did and creating a policy, and I shouldn't say you, by the Goldwater policy statement that was put out there that is sparking these bills, and now this proposition, you are creating situations where there will be serious problems that have to be corrected, and time and effort that could have been focused on fixing the existing process is now going to be focused on fixing this. I'm not being paid by this. Goldwater. We're volunteers. I understand that. My son that. is a volunteer. He's and 13 years old. I understand We're that. We're doing this to help other people. And I So to try you. and put us under that umbrella or portray it in any other way, we're volunteers. We want to help other sick kids, other people who need and the drugs. Great. Give them a right to try to save their and own I, lives. And we are all in agreement. And Arizonans are smart enough to make informed decisions along with their physicians and drug manufacturers. Please, last word. Last word is that when we look at the right to try, and I'm speaking personally, not on behalf of any corporation, when we look at the right to try, what we're looking at is how do we get the best care for Arizona patients in the best way? And there are enough flaws in this piece of public policy that this is not the best way. Okay. We have to stop it right there. Right. Thank you both very Thank much you. for joining us. Great debate. Thanks. Thanks very much. Inside scoop on what's happening at Arizona PBS. Become an aid insider. You'll receive weekly updates on the most anticipated upcoming programs and events. Get the aid insider delivered to your email inbox. Visit azpbs.org to sign up today. A new ASU study that looks at the impact of humans on deadly aggression among chimpanzees is also raising questions on whether or not humans are predisposed to violence. ASU anthropologist Ian Gilby joins us now to discuss his study. Good to have you here. Thanks for What exactly did you look at out there? Well, thanks for having me, first off. Well, uh, chimpanzees are really unusual among mammals, among animals in general, um, in that they practice coalitionary lethal aggression. So meaning they will essentially team up with one another and kill other chimpanzees. Yes. Um, so we're, we were interested in, um, in trying to explain that very unusual 
behavior. And that, that what you're looking at is whether or not human interaction or just, just the slightest impact of human existence is changing chimp behavior? Right. So there is, I mean, there's really two, two alternative explanations for, to explain this, this lethal aggression. One is that it's an adaptive behavior, that chimps get a ben have a, some kind of benefit either by m achieving more mating success, more food, something like that from um, the aggression. Or the alternative is that, and it's sort of a small, um, re relatively vocal group that, that advocates for this position, um, suggests that it's aberrant behavior that's a byproduct of human disturbance of some kind. And so you tried to figure out which was correct. Exactly. And what'd you find? Well, this, uh, and by, this, by, by we in this case, I mean 30 authors on a giant study. It's actually a really impressive um, collaboration headed up by Michael Wilson at the University of Minnesota and uh, Richard Wrangham at Harvard. And we together pooled data from 18 different chimpanzee sites 426 years of data wow. um, to address whether or not um, chimpanzee violence, or specifically chimpanzee killings, were um, affected by uh, ecological factors or by human disturbance. And again, what did you find? Well, we found that it's ecological factors and not human disturbance. So basically, occasionally, a chimp is going to kill a chimp. Yeah. And there may not be, re will it be adaptive? Will it be because well, of, of territory? Yes, there is, a lot, there is a lot of evidence, actually, that it is adaptive, that um, territories increase in size after a, um, kill an intergroup killing has occurred. Mm. Um, we know also that with larger territories, female chimpanzees reproduce more quickly. They have more surviving offspring. Um, they're even heavier during when they have a larger, larger range. So there are definite advantages to having a larger territory. Are there triggers that set off these lethal attacks? Oh, that's a great question. They um, go on patrols, so they go out to the edge of their range, groups of males quietly, stealthily traveling yes. along, it, apparently searching for uh, members of the neighboring community. But there doesn't seem to be, they, sometimes they're brought together by a rich food source, for example. So if there's a nice fruiting tree at the edge of the range that two communities will, will be drawn to, then you may have an intergroup inter attack. But now, and, and again, you, you st was this studied in, w and you said a lot of years and a lot of chimps were looked at. Was it basically one general location? Was it all over all the All across Africa. So East Africa through Central Africa to West Africa. So we can't just say it's one group of chimps don't seem to have this. Exactly. You also studied bonobos, correct? There were four bonobo studies in addition, in, in addition to those 18 chimps and groups. And the bonobos aren't killing each other? There was one case. One case. One case. In, in I think it's 97 years, I think it was, of, of, of uh, observation Are total. they just more peaceful animals or what do we know they are they certainly seem to be it seems to be a very they seem to be very divergent from from common chimpanzees in that regard yeah. a little more laid back yeah yeah to take yeah. things as they lay yeah, exactly think. okay so what do we take from this study especially as it, it involves human evolution and maybe our predisposition to violence war killing etc sure well I mean that's something obviously we have to be very cautious about um, and, but it is interesting to note that I said at the beginning that chimpanzees are very unusual in that they practice coalitionary lethal aggression. Yeah. Humans do it too, right? Mm -hmm. So there's, that's a very interesting connection. Um, as anthropologists, we are trying to understand what it means to be human and particularly how we became human. And so and then we're talking about lots of different traits, morphological traits, um, bipedalism, big brains, behavior, life history, and so on. And a lot of those traits, the fossil record helps us with. So Lucy, who was discovered by Don Johansson at ASU, um, we know she was bipedal because of her pelvis. But behavior doesn't fossilize. And so one of the tricks is to use living primates um, as a referential model for what our earliest ancestors may have been like. So see what, the, see what the early primates are doing now and kind of look and compare as right. to what and, the fossils are. Right, and you know, chimpanzees are our closest living relatives, um, and there's more and more evidence that the last common ancestor of apes and humans um, was very chimp-like. So we're not saying that this is the way our, the last common ancestor was, but it, uh, their current uh, information suggests, it just gives us clues toward yes. what we were starting from. Before I let you go, real quickly, did anything about this study surprise you? No. 
You, this is, so you basically thought that it wasn't human interaction, it was basically adaptive behavior. Exactly. Yep, there was no, for, and for most of us, it's, it was not a surprise. Yeah, all right. Must be fun studying chimps. Is it, it's is, is it's, it's exciting. It's yeah. exciting. Yeah, put it that way. Never yeah. a dull moment out <laughs> right. here. Uh, right. Thank you so much for being here. We appreciate it. No problem. It. Thank you. Thursday on Arizona Horizon, a federal judge is expected to decide if same-sex marriage is constitutional in Arizona. We'll talk about that, and we'll talk about Hispanic education in a new Arizona Horizon series, Arizona Education. That's Thursday evening at 5:30 and 10, right here on Arizona Horizon. That is it for now. I'm Ted Simons. Thank you so much for joining us. You have a great evening. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you.